Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks again for joining us at Heritage this morning, especially for this Mother's Day. I always look forward to getting to see some of the familiar faces who live in other cities or are part of other church families in our city, and they've come to visit with us today because this is where their mother's church home is, and it's so fun to be able to connect with so many of you and to think together and celebrate together all the women who have taken care of us as if we were their children, whether we were their children or not. And so um, we all know a mother's love is one of the great blessings in this life. And so we applaud moms and together we celebrate you today. And I want to be, I, I have an opportunity to tell you how much I love it when there are children crying in our, in our, in our, in our and I, listen, I'm not being sarcastic at all. I want you to know I'm loving every minute of that because if there's no crying in our church, the church is dying, right? And so all of the moms in here, yeah. So all of the moms in here, you have my permission to always believe that, that your baby is welcome in this room, okay? It is never, never an inconvenience for us. I wanna tell you and remind you that last week here at Heritage, we kicked off a short series of messages called One Small Step. And in this series, what we're doing is we're taking a flyover look at some of the stages of a healthy spiritual life. And we acknowledge together, we understand that everybody's spiritual journey is unique because of our own experiences, our own background, our own temperament. The path that you took to get you to this point is one of a kind, but when it comes to the way that God interacts with us, when it comes to the way that God leads us, there are some stages that are common to every spiritual journey. And so last week we began that conversation talking about how the spiritual journey starts with a response to the invitation of God. We looked together at a, a, a familiar story that maybe you've seen represented on the big screen. I was corrected, by the way, that uh, Prince of Egypt is not a Disney movie. Let, I had a few people let me know that's a DreamWorks picture, and I apologize for my mistake on that, but we looked at this story, this Old Testament story of the, from the book of Exodus when God rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, and what happened in that story is that they experienced God's blessing first, and it's important to think about that order. It's important because this is how the spiritual journey works. They experienced God's blessing first, and then then God asked them, I want to ask you to make a bold decision, an act of commitment to trust me with your future. It was after the people of Israel had experienced God's love, God's rescue, God's salvation, that they were then invited to make a commitment to be followers and disciples of God. I would love for you to go back and listen to last week's message if you missed it. But the reason that we examined that ancient story together last week is because that ancient story is like every spiritual story, like every spiritual journey. Every spiritual journey follows that pattern where God is the initiator. God is the first one to put himself out there. God is the one who offers rescue and blessing and purpose and then invites us to respond to his invitation. And God has given us this beautiful process to signify and to, to point out that commitment. It's this simple ceremonial process that we call baptism. And in baptism, you, you climb down into that water and you immerse yourself in that water as you state your belief in God's love for you and God's plan for your life. And baptism is not a complicated process. In fact, it's a small step. One small step for a person to take, but it really does represent a giant leap of faith and the beginning of a lifetime of walking with God. And we were intentional about using that terminology, that one small step terminology, and most of you, most of you would recognize that from those very famous first words that were spoken at the time when, we, when somebody first landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong spoke that famous quote about it being one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. 
And I chose space travel as a theme for this series because of all of its profound parallels to the spiritual journey. In fact, one of my friends here in the church last week pointed out that my little spaceman on here is, is act, gotta be somebody of very deep faith because he seems to be doing a moonwalk with no oxygen tank on his back. You know, like, <laughs> you gotta be really, really faithful, you know, to try that, I guess. But I've always had an interest in space travel. In fact, it's a little known fact about me around here, but before I ever started training for the ministry, I spent some time in Cape Canaveral, Florida, learning how to be an astronaut. Now, don't get too impressed. I, I don't want to give you the wrong idea. There was never actually any chance that I was going to space. I, was, I wasn't tall enough, really. But then, but when I was in seventh grade, I won a citywide student essay contest, and the grand prize was an all-expenses-paid trip to space camp. And so I got to travel to space camp, fly to Florida, and spend a week with a bunch of other nerdy middle school kids just like me who were pretending to be astronauts. In fact, there is one surviving photograph from my time at space camp that I, we've got to display. <laughs> this is 13-year-old Brock in some museum looking really excited to be riding shotgun on a replica of the lunar rover. As you can see, I had a great time. Space camp was awesome. And we learned a lot, but the even cooler part about that week was that we got to act out our dreams of what it would be like to be real space travelers. We spent the entire week training and planning for two missions for our team to carry out using the Space Shuttle Flight Simulator. Every camper got to do one mission inside the simulator and another mission working in mission control, providing guidance from the ground and support for those who were on the ship. And we practiced communication and we practiced procedures that required us to work together and support one another to get the mission accomplished and all the experiments and all the different tasks that we were going to do. And the whole point, the whole goal of the exercise was for us to experience what it's like when a group of people focus their energy and their attention on a common goal. When a group of people who didn't know each other just a few days ago are trying to attempt to accomplish something significant. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it in this sermon series. Because as we consider the stages of each individual person's spiritual journey, it's important to understand that God always places his followers into community. God places his followers into communities on purpose. And it's not simply a matter of being invited to a community or being welcomed into a community. The fact is that active participation in a community of disciples is one of those mile markers on a spiritual journey that God has planned for each and every one of us. Active participation with other people who are on this journey is part of what God has designed the spiritual journey to include. In fact, one of the incredible things about God's plan for us is the way that your unique faith has a unique opportunity to help me grow. And my unique faith has a unique opportunity to help you grow. And there are examples and encouragements about this throughout the pages of the Bible, but today I'd like to steer our attention together to the New Testament book of Ephesians. We're going to put these verses up on the screen today, but you're welcome to follow along with us because we're going to get a perspective of what this stage of the spiritual journey is supposed to look like and how this is supposed to work. You need to know that Ephesians is nothing more than a letter. It was a letter that was written over 1,900 years ago by a missionary named Paul who traveled all over the Mediterranean Rim, the same areas where Peter and Rhea and some of our other missionary connections are working today. And at one point, Paul found himself sitting in a prison cell where he wrote this letter, this letter Ephesians, to a group of Christians that he had taught in the city of Ephesus, back in the early days of his ministry. But Christians for centuries, ever since then, Christians have discovered that this letter helps us to understand and appreciate God better too. And so it's valuable for you and for me. You see, in Ephesians, Paul's got a big vision of what church could be. 
In Ephesians, Paul is dreaming big. He's painting a big picture of what's possible in the community of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, God's love is too much for you to ever fully comprehend, for you to ever fully understand. There's no way that he could describe it to you because he hasn't been able to plumb its depths either. He says in the third chapter of this letter, though, he says, you'll never be able to fully comprehend God's love for you, but may you experience the love of Christ. He doesn't say, may you understand it all. That would be impossible. He says, may you experience it. May you experience the love of Christ that will convince you of its validity. May you experience the love of Christ that will convince you of its scope. May you experience something that's so much bigger than you that you can't help but give God glory for it. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully. And this is Paul's hope. Paul's hope is that everybody he ever brought to faith, his students, his disciples, that they would be continually stepping into a deeper and deeper experience of the love of Christ so that their faith would be expanded. Last week we talked about those, those people of Israel who were taking those first steps out into the Red Sea. We talked about that young man in legendary Jewish folklore who was the first one to put his feet into the water and to walk towards the opposite shore and the water kept rising up further up his legs and up his body and finally he got to the point where he was having to swim and then God parted the sea and brought the dry ground up to him. This is a picture of what Paul is envisioning for his disciples, that we would be people who were constantly walking out deeper and deeper and deeper into the love of God. And so this entire letter, this is what this is about. This whole letter of Ephesians is about how to grow in faith. And the passage that I want us to look at this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 4, the fourth chapter. Now remember, chapters were inserted later. Paul didn't insert chapters when he was writing this thing. These were added later to help us find stuff easier. But in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, which tells us something. He's not in prison for having done anything wrong. He's in prison because he has, he has disturbed somebody else's peace by preaching this good news about Jesus. He says, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you. Don't miss that word. It's not, I instruct you. And it's not, I encourage you. It's deeper than that. He's trying to tell you that your spiritual journey depends on what he's about to say. I'm begging you, if my teaching to you has meant anything, if my example to you has meant anything, if the intervention of Jesus in your life has meant anything, he says, I beg you to lead a life that's worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Now, listen for a second, because in English, it's so easy for us to hear that and think that Paul's talking to me. But I'm going to read it in Texan. As a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg y'all to lead a life worthy of y'all's calling. How many apostrophes does y'all have, y'alls have in it? I've never known. I beg you to lead a life worthy of y'all's calling, for y'all have been called by God. He's not right. He's not writing this to an individual. He didn't write this to one person at Ephesus. Who did he write it to? The Ephesians, right, all y'all in Ephesus. <laughs> he wrote it to all of them. He's writing to a group, he's writing to a church, and he says, y'all have been called by God. The church has a particular call, and Paul says, please, 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 I beg of you, live out y'all's call. Live out y'all's calling. And in the next verse, he's going to elaborate on how that happens. Verse 2, he says, Always, 
Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Come on, Paul. For real? I don't like, I don't like doing that. I do not like making allowance for other people's faults. You know when I like allowance for faults is when it's for my faults. He says, I want you to make allowance for each other's faults because of y'all's love. Make every effort to keep y'all's selves united in the spirit, binding y'all's selves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit. All right, you're listening to that, right? He says, there's really only one. It's not a whole lot of scattered individuals. There's really one. There's one body. There's one spirit that has tied us together just as y'all have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Now, that's not how it works everywhere, right? If you go about your day-to-day -day life, you probably, you might have noticed that there is a little bit of division among humans. Come on, I'm being sarcastic. You don't have to look hard at all to discover the brokenness and the division in the world that we live in, and we'll divide over virtually anything. We're divided over political views and nationality and race and religion and brand loyalty and political positions and everything in between. But Paul says it's different if you're a follower of Jesus. He says if you're the per one of those people who has taken that one small step, who has decided, who has committed themselves, who has stepped into the water and said, I wanna be a follower of Jesus. I would rather go with God than go back to what I used to be. If you're one of those people, Paul says, our love for one another is supposed to surpass every other factor that might divide us. Every other factor that might divide us. Whichever one you're thinking that I'm not talking about right now, I'm talking about that one. Every other factor that might divide us. Paul says our commitment to Jesus, our decision to step into the water, our love for one another should surpass every other factor because we have become part of the one body, the one community that Jesus formed when he called us. We're all heading in the same direction. We're all on the same team. And so we're supposed to stay united to one another, bound together with peace that comes from God. Not from willpower, not even from our conviction. Peace that comes from God. And Paul says, Paul teaches that the more we stick together as a church, the more we look past our divisions and overcome our divisions by Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit, the more that that happens, he says, the more progress that we each individually make on the spiritual journey. When we live life together and overcome our differences and make room and allowance for each other's faults and we stay humble and gentle and all of the things that he mentioned in those previous verses, Paul says that's how you grow. Listen to what he says. We're going to skip down to verse 11. He says, now these are the gifts that and these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. He says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do God's work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. What Paul is telling us here is that Jesus has a development plan for the church. And it's not just for individuals. It's a development plan for the entire community of believers. Jesus has given us a responsibility to one another. And it's important here to note that the church, when I say the church, we're not talking about an organization. We're certainly not talking about a building. The church is a community. It's a gathering of people who are connected by a common bond. And Paul lists 
some of the servants in the church. He lists the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And he's not listing them because they're more important or more valuable. He's explaining that those servants in the church have a responsibility to help everyone in the church be ready to live out our calling. He says, we've got work to do. He says, we need to keep growing. We need to keep maturing. We need to keep connecting with one another until we become mature in the Lord. That's the project we're working to accomplish. You know, it's interesting if you think, if you take that line of thought, uh, that uh, concept to its logical conclusion. What it's saying is that if there's one person in the church who's very mature in the Lord, person A is very mature in the Lord, and person B is not very mature in the Lord, it means person A hasn't finished their maturing yet because there's still work to do. We owe it to one another. We're connected to one another. We are one body following one spirit. There is no you versus you. There is no me and you different. We're one. Have you ever been a part of the, had the experience of working on a group project in school or maybe you were part of a team and there were some members of the team who let the, uh, the rest of the team down? You ever had that? Some of you hate getting assigned to a group project, you know, because you know that's how it's going to work out. You're going to be the one that ends up carrying all the weight. It's so disappointing to be in that position because everybody loses and the team's goal, the team's mission suffers. But I tell you what, there's something special that happens when you're on a team and everybody is fully engaged, right? There's something almost magical that happens when you're part of a team and everybody is pulling in the same direction. When that happens, everybody on the team is better for it and the team accomplishes so much more. The output is exponentially higher than it could have possibly been with any of those individuals working on their own. Can you imagine, can you dream about it and imagine what it would feel like if every single follower of Jesus who walked into our church services felt that their primary job in this community was to build unity and closeness with each other? If we all walked in here on Sunday morning, not like dragging our feet because we're so, like, I finally made it to Sunday where I can be spiritually refreshed. You know, like I get that, but what if, what if we showed up here with the expectation and the preparation having been made so that we could pour ourselves out for the sake of this community? What if we showed up here and we said, you know what, I'm not just here to receive, I'm gonna receive, because I'm in the company of other disciples of Jesus who are here to give, but I'm here to give too. I'm here to pour myself out. I'm here to be a servant. I'm here to be an encourager. I'm here to be a worshiper. I'm here to be a supporter. What if every Christian who walked into our church services thought, I'm here to build unity. I'm here to help each other, to help my family grow in maturity toward God? What if we showed up on Sunday morning with the goal of building this community? I think somewhere along the line, it became common to think that attending church is a, an individual experience. That the songs are here so that each person can connect to God. And the sermon is here so that each person can learn about or hear about God. But the truth is, that's never been what any of this is for. The reason we gather and the reason we sing and the reason we pray and the reason that we take the Lord's Supper together is not so that you can connect with God individually. Because you could do that on your own. You could do that elsewhere. You could be by yourself and not you know, feel like you got to get all dressed up and you don't have to mess with getting the kids ready and you could be in some place that's real scenic and you could do that on your own. But the reason that we gather together and do all of this together is so that we can connect with God together. And so that God can do the work, the spiritual work of connecting us to one another.
so that God can begin to erase the significance of our divisions, so that God can deal with the obstacles that keep us from immediately seeing one another as family. This is what God is doing among us. We're coming together so that together we can remember the one thing that we all have in common that outweighs all of our differences, and it's our, our calling to follow Jesus. And so we don't gather here on Sunday for an individual experience. We gather for a community experience. We're building unity with one another, which means that here in just a few minutes, it means that our work's not over when the closing prayer gets prayed or the closing song gets played. It means that we don't have to rush out and head to the car as soon as the music stops. It means we're here and we're supposed to be strengthening our connection, building our unity, and we have to keep working on that. In fact, in Christ, this is only, I'm going to tell you, there's no other community on the planet that does this. In Christ, we have the opportunity to celebrate our differences. To celebrate, which is an active verb. It doesn't just mean tolerate our differences. It means that we actively praise God for the diversity that exists among us. It means that together we don't just tolerate what separates us, we celebrate the new reality that Jesus has created a family in spite of our differences. We rally around the one thing that binds us together. And Paul says, if we'll do that, if we will look around the room and get to know one another and support one another in this spiritual life, if we'll walk together, if we'll care for one another, despite how much differently we may think or believe or engage, he says, then, verse 14, then, we will no longer be immature like children. That's a strong word. He says, then, after we have invested ourselves in community, after we have committed to being humble and gentle, after we have decided to allow for and make room for one another's faults, after we've committed to be patient with one another and celebrate our differences, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. In other words, our life together, our life in community, our experience as a group, has a direct effect on our individual spiritual growth. This is what I'm trying to tell you. That the spiritual journey that you have been called to take with God is not a journey that you take alone. Paul says together, if we build unity in our faith and knowledge of Christ, then together we will become mature. We won't be immature like children. Instead, he says in verse 15, he says, instead, we will speak the truth to one another in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. We could, we could take a detour here and talk about the passages of Scripture where Paul describes the body and all of the members of the church at like different parts of the body and there's a big toe and there's an elbow and there's a wrist and a finger and all of that kind of stuff. We'll do that lesson a different day. But you need to hear that if Christ is the head of the body, as verse 15 says, that body has many parts. Paul says in the next verse, he says, God or Jesus makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Can you imagine? There's some people in here who are a lot different than you. Boy, there's people in here who think different than you and talk different than you and live different than you and cook different than you and vote different than you and believe different than you. There's a lot of people in here who are really different than you. I even think there's probably like some Yankees fans in here. And so there's people in here that are way different than you. But Paul says, Jesus makes all of that fit together perfectly. Can you imagine? 
Is there any way in under human power that that would be possible? I don't think so. Paul says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. As one member of the body does its own function and lives out the calling that it has, it helps the other parts of the body to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What Paul is telling us here is that you need, not y'all, you need a faith-centered community in order to experience your full spiritual potential. This journey that you have been invited to start, you need a faith centered community in order to reach the destination, in order to go where you're supposed to go. Faith is a group project. It's a team effort. And God has never called anyone to walk their faith journey alone. If you go alone, you won't get very far. You need your church family in order to get where God's calling you to go. But the opposite of that statement is also true. The faith-centered community needs you in order to experience its full spiritual potential. This church family, our connection with each other will never be its, what, it, what it could be, never reach its full potential until all of us have decided to engage with one another. We depend on one another. We're in this together. It's a process of maturing, a process that won't be finished until we're so unified that we measure up to the standard of Jesus. And your spiritual growth, your progress, your maturity depends on being part of a faith-centered community. It depends on being part of the church. It depends on connection. And in the same breath, the church's spiritual maturity depends on being part of your journey, depends on being part of your life. It depends on being connected with you. This is how it's always been. You know, when those people of Israel that we talked about last week, when they stepped into the Red Sea, they were making a decision that they were gonna trust in God's power and love together. And God parted the waters and they crossed the sea on dry ground and they were finally, finally totally free from the Egyptians who had ruled and abused them for so long. But when they got to the other shoreline, when they reached that moment of freedom and they stepped off the sea floor and onto the beach, they were in unfamiliar territory. They were in a desert. They had a long way to go. Can you imagine if they had all said, well, that was amazing, see you later, and took off in their own separate directions across the desert? Can you imagine if they shook hands and parted ways and decided that each family would go their own way and figure out their own path? They didn't do that, they stayed together. They traveled together. They gathered food together. They worshiped together. They grew together. They had a common spiritual life, a common spiritual experience, a common engagement with God, and it all happened as they took their next steps with God together, and by the time they reached the other end of that desert, and there's a long story in between point A and point B there, but by the time they reached the other side of that desert, their communal faith had grown, and they had more confidence in God than they had ever had before because they watched and they reflected and they commemorated together what God had done among them and what God had done for them. We ought to do the same. We ought to remember and celebrate and commemorate together what God has done among us.